Welcome, this is Deep Dive featuring Hudson Institute. And in today's edition, we're going to focus on the latest developments, of course, here in Israel, throughout the region and beyond, with focus also on the latest developments vis-a-vis -vis the United States, the war in Lebanon, Gaza, Iran, and more. To do that, let's now turn to Washington, D.C., where we're joined by Dr. Mike Duran, formerly the Senior Director at the National Security Council in Washington for the Middle East and North Africa regions, and currently the Director of the Center for Peace and Security in the Middle East and a Senior Fellow at Hudson Institute. It's good to see you, Mike. I'd like to immediately ask you about a piece you've published on the Wall Street Journal uh, titled Israel Kills Sinwar and Biden Wants to Move On. Uh, lay it in layman's terms for us a little bit more of a, a broader context so we understand uh, what does it actually mean and also in reference to the today's current state of play. Well, the, uh, Jonathan, thank you. You know, when you write articles, there's nothing you love more than to have people uh, talk to you about them. So I appreciate that. The uh, the uh, key issue hanging over us today, I think, for our discussion is that uh, last week, the Israelis uh, killed Yahya Sanwar, the head of Hamas. Um, that organization now, like Hezbollah, is uh, effectively decapitated. Um, and um, we, w there's a question about what, what that means. The Biden administration, as you suggested, they want to use this, uh, leverage this to bring an end to the war in keeping with their thesis that they, have been, that they have been expressing for a long time now, which is that a ceasefire in Gaza will lead to a ceasefire in all of the other seven fronts of this war, and especially between Israel and Hezbollah. Israel and Iran and Israel and the Houthis or and the Houthis and the the international uh, uh, community. Uh, I I personally I'd be very interested in hearing um, what our other guests uh, have to say about that. I personally am skeptical that this will succeed uh, because the realities on the ground in Gaza, in Lebanon, and in between Israel and Iran have moved on significantly. Uh, President Prime Minister Netanyahu's recent statements suggest that uh, he thinks now it's possible for Israel to negotiate directly with local commanders on the ground in Gaza, that you can go over the head of the currently non-existing uh, Hamas leadership um, and cut a deal with local commanders, uh, by, according to which they will return hostages in return for their lives. Um, in, in Lebanon, the Israeli government's under enormous pressure, domestic political pressure, to convince all of those Israelis who have been displaced from the north that they can go back to their homes without uh, being potential victims of an October 7th-like attack from Hezbollah or from rocket uh, attacks, from rocket or missile or drone attacks from, uh, from Hezbollah or Iran. O over the weekend, uh, Hezbollah launched an attack against the home of uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu in Caesarea, um, uh, which just serves to highlight the difficulty of suppressing these weapons. Despite all the blows that Hezbollah has taken, it's still capable of getting these off. It's probably doing so under the direct guidance of the um, uh, of the Iranians. And that, of course, only serves to remind us uh, of the, uh, the big non-news, uh, 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 Jonathan, which is that the Israel has still not carried out a reprisal attack against Iran. Uh, so I don't expect that we're going to see any really serious movement toward a, peace, a ceasefire agreement until after the American election, and certainly not until after this uh, Israeli reprisal attack against Iran, which I think has become all the more certain after the um, Iranians tried to kill Prime Minister Netanyahu through Hezbollah. We'll try to dissect also uh, what are the implications of such a move. But for uh, that, I'd like uh, initially to turn here in uh, central Israel to Brigadier General in Reserve Yossi Kupelwasser, formerly the Director General of the Israeli Ministry for Strategic Affairs, uh, as well as the head of the Research and Assessment Division at the IDF Intelligence Directorate, currently the Project Director at uh, the Jerusalem Center for Foreign uh, Relations, or I don't know already which name uh, your uh, think tank has adopted these days, uh, General. Foreign Affairs. Foreign Affairs, brilliant. Well, uh, with that, uh, General Kupelwasser, 
the implications of uh, the elimination of Yahya Sinwal, to what degree are they currently felt in Gaza? And uh, are we expected to see the center of gravity shift out of Gaza once again into potentially Doha, Qatar, maybe Ankara and Turkey or Tehran in Iran? I think the killing of uh, and the elimination of uh, Yahya Sinwar is important. It's not the end of the world. The war still is going to continue. But it's a milestone in uh, sending the message to everybody, including those who insist on being deaf to those messages, that uh, the war has changed. And whereas we began the war in a very difficult situation and the question of whether Israel can su sustain uh, the kind of threats it, uh, it faces was it, uh, on the agenda, uh, the tables have turned. And uh, now with the killing of uh, Sinwar and with the elimination of Hassan Asala in Lebanon, and uh, the, while everybody braces for uh, the Israeli attack in, uh, in Iran, uh, the question is whether the Iranian axis is going to be able to stand after this war. And uh, I think people didn't, don't understand that what happened in the last month, more than ever, is this uh, total change of the, end, uh, of the end state that Israel is trying to, to accomplish. Yes, we still are eager to see the hostages uh, released, and we want to make sure that Hamas uh, loses the war in Gaza. But now the, the goals are wider than just that. And uh, I think uh, that uh, we try to take advantage of what happened in, uh, with the killing of uh, Sinwar in order to, uh, as uh, Mike said, to change the, the rules of the game in Gaza. It's not about uh, reaching an agreement with Hamas. It's about convincing Hamas to give up. And uh, that's the, the main message that the Prime Minister carried in his speech after the elimination of uh, Sinwar. You want to survive? Give us the hostages and you are going to get a free passage out. Uh, that's the, the new state of, the, uh, state of affairs in, uh, in Gaza. Now, is it going to really be like that? Uh, it's, uh, it's not clear. The Hamas doesn't want to give up, of course, and it's going to take more pressure before we are going to get any closer to having this happening. But without Sinwar, with everything that he symbolizes, uh, with the, his involvement and the, his responsibility for the 7th of October massacre and his uh, leadership uh, and charisma, it's going to be much diff more difficult for Hamas to keep control of Gaza the way they did as long as, Hamas, as, long as Sinwar was there. And uh, it's not going to disappear overnight, but this is what's going to happen. Inside Gaza, the, the leadership of Hamas was uh, more or less eliminated, with the exception of uh, uh, Mohammed Sinwar, his brother, uh, that doesn't uh, enjoy the same kind of uh, respect from everybody in the, in the Gaza Strip. Uh, the situation has changed dramatically. And uh, the question is whether we, we are going to be wise enough in order to uh, translate these changes into a better option of uh, releasing the hostages. That's what's at stake right now. And uh, the government, uh, the cabinet was sitting on that uh, issue last night uh, until the middle of the, the night, trying to, to develop new ideas, uh, how we can capitulate on, uh, on what happened in, in Gaza. Capitalize on it, indeed. Uh, well, let's turn to Washington, D.C., where we're joined by Mr. Marshall Billingsley, formerly the Assistant Secretary uh, General of NATO, a uh, former Assistant Secretary of the Treasury of the, in the United States for countering terror financing and currently, of course, a senior fellow at Hudson Institute. It's great to see you, Marshall. I'd like to ask you particularly on a defense ministerial by the G7 uh, during the course of which they deliberated much of what's occurring currently in the Middle East. They, of course, also deliberated the situation vis-a-vis -vis Russia and Ukraine, uh, the situation in the Pacific and more. Uh, but uh, one of the, the most interesting uh, statements that uh, they read out and, and adopted together was the fact that they're calling upon Iran to sever its malign support for organizations such as Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis in Yemen, and other Shiite militias in the region, uh, which I, I ask myself, who, who do they think they're speaking to? And to what degree do they understand or even uh, fully comprehend the complexities of the matter at a time when Iran is not just the head of the octopus, but it also is directing what is to be happened on most of those fronts? 
Yeah, I, I, I think that that was a nice rhetorical flourish <clears throat> that shows a complete lack of appreciation for the absolute theocratic uh, commitment that the Ayatollah has to the export of the Shia revolution. And the fact that all of these terror proxy groups established, managed, and maintained by the Quds Force for the Ayatollah are there for one purpose and one purpose only, which is revolutionary export. Uh, there is zero chance under the mullahs in Tehran that Iran will back away from its terror support uh, and from the use of the terror apparatus to destabilize uh, countries in the region. Thank you, uh, Mr. Billingsley. Let's now turn to central Israel, where we're joined by Brigadier General in Reserve Anon Sofrin, formerly the head of the intelligence directorate at Mossad, as well as a senior officer at the IDF Intelligence Directorate. It's great to see you, General. I'd like to ask you, at a time uh, when we're seeing throughout the region uh, various condemnations, not only from malign actors, but also of uh, uh, some countries, uh, condemning Israel for the elimination of Yahya Sinwar, uh, it seems like the international community in the West seems to praise Israel in contrast, but nonetheless, it seems to be uh, or focused on the necessity to implement a ceasefire, to de-escalate something that I think uh, Dr. Duran has mentioned more than once, that there is a certain obsession with the word de-escalation without any strategic day after. What needs to be relayed to those Western leaders to try and and uh, revamp their understanding of the strategic complexities which this region is beset in. First of all, they have to understand that the fact that Yehis Anwar is dead, it's not the end of Hamas. Hamas is still alive and kicking. It still has its own capabilities. It won't give up. They won't uh, wave with a white flag and say we are willing to get uh, out of this game. No, it, it won't happen. They will keep on fighting. With their own capabilities, they are now what we see just now in, in Jibalia. They rebuilt their own capabilities. They re, re restructured all the used tunnels, underground tunnels that were there, that were demolished partly by the IDF. So it's not the end of the game, and uh, we still have uh, to get uh, along with Hamas. And as long as we don't have any idea or any, let's say, arrangement, that will enable somebody else to control Gaza Strip, we still have to maintain our capabilities there and we'll still have to go and uh, keep on fighting and uh, make in parallel any effort to release all the people abducted and held in Gaza. You, whether they're dead or alive, it doesn't really matter. They have to be to get back home. That's, five, that's phase A. The second one is what happens with uh, the Lebanese front. The fact that uh, Nasrallah is dead, the fact is that all the senior commanders are eliminated, doesn't mean that uh, Hezbollah is done just like Hamas. They keep on fighting, they keep on launching rockets and missiles and UAVs and armed UAVs into Israel. And it's not the end of the game. And it doesn't have to be connected one to <clears throat> one to the, to the other side. That means that if we will get to some agreement on ceasefire in Gaza, doesn't really mean or necessarily mean that they are going to have a ceasefire with Hezbollah. And now we have the leverage to uh, force Hezbollah to get into a ceasefire by our own terms, because we are now on the upper hand and we can force him to go uh, and change his ideas about what should be done in the next phase in Lebanon. Indeed. Well, Dr. Duran, we're hearing Defense Minister Yav Gallant earlier this weekend uh, speaking about uh, a long list of uh, successes uh, that uh, the IDF has achieved uh, along uh, the, the Lebanese front, particularly in the villages there, uh, in which it has reached a certain straight state of transition from a uh, deliberate contact with uh, the enemy to eliminate as many as possible Hezbollah terror operatives alongside, of course, the fact that many of those terror operatives are surrendering to the IDF, providing invaluable uh, information, intelligence for uh, moving uh, forward, and now 
entering a stage of demolition, destroying, degrading Hezbollah's terror infrastructure along the border. Uh, this is, of course, not uh, the end of the line, and Jerusalem's top defense official alluded to that by highlighting that this is the the next stage before the what's about to follow. My understanding of the debate in, in Jerusalem right now at the top levels of the government um, is that there's two currents of opinion. One current of opinion is um, in keeping with uh, what General Cooper Vosser said a minute ago, which is that it, it highlights the fact that there has been a major strategic shift in the whole region and that this opens up new opportunities for Israel to change the balance of power entirely with, with uh, Iran and all of its, um, its proxies. The other school of thought is, uh, is, is t uh, talking about moving towards some kind of, uh, some kind of interim end to the war. This won't be an end to the war. Uh, because it, the war won't end until Iran and its proxies are um, are weakened or uh, really weakened well beyond the state that they're in now or defeated, uh, but uh, is arguing that they should start thinking about interim goals under which they could accept a cease um, uh, a ceasefire. So what's going to happen is going to you know it's going to be uh, uh, how events influence those the uh, those those two sides. Unfortunately, the Americans, as we've said are carrying out a policy that gives aid and comfort to the Iran, uh, Iran and, it, and its proxies, because an immediate ceasefire will allow Hezbollah to stay alive and to regroup. It will allow Hamas to regroup and so on. So I think the, uh, the, the goals, whatever the Israelis decide to do, whether they decide to go all the way with Iran or to have uh, some kind of interim um, ceasefire, the immediate goal should be to totally secure the border of uh, uh, the, the the have a buffer in the border between Israel and um, and Lebanon, so that uh, so that the Radwan forces cannot come back anywhere near the border whatsoever. Continue to degrade uh, Hezbollah's capabilities uh, to send rockets and missiles into Israel. Uh, but in Gaza, it's very important to begin to separate Hamas from the uh, from the population and the key to that is the is the uh, humanitarian aid the americans have insisted on humanitarian aid going in the current human system of distributing the aid is totally controlled by hamas which means that it can play favorites into uh, into by distributing the aid but it also it also skims off um, uh, money off the top, uh, but through uh, corrupt, uh, p p uh, corrupt uh, payments. Um, and so you have to take that economic uh, uh, tool and tool of uh, uh, political control away from, uh, uh, away from Hamas. That's a complex operation, and it's going to take time. Mr. Billingsley, there was a uh, damning report about a leak coming out of the United States about Israel's intended targets, a document classified as top secret, uh, which was uh, supposed to be only uh, for the eyes of uh, the five eyes, uh, ironically. But nonetheless, uh, the Iranians have uh, gained that information. Uh, what can be done? Uh, I don't even want to go into the consequences of this since uh, uh, we'll have to wait and see, but what, what should be done in order to confront this issue? Uh, which is, of course, uh, very damaging to relations and trust. Well, I can't comment on the particulars, having having not seen uh, the documents in question and have no idea about their veracity. Uh, I do think it's indicative of the uh, lack of trust that it now exists between the Biden-Harris administration and the government of Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, look, the 2020 elections had consequences. They had disastrous consequences for the American people with our own economy, for the people of Afghanistan, for the people of Ukraine, and for the people of Israel. Uh, and as we now are just two weeks away from the 2024 elections, I'm sure the government in, in, in Israel is watching this very closely. It does appear that uh, President Trump is pulling fairly far ahead in most of the, the key battleground states. And I'm sure that comes as a significant uh, a, a potential uh, degree of relief for the people of Israel and for the government. Uh, my hope is that we will have a new government in January of next year that will be uh, all in uh, in supporting Israel with having closed with the terrorist organizations, now finishing them off. 
It was a grave mistake to, it's a grave mistake anywhere in the world to allow sanctuaries to be established for terror groups. And this is precisely what happened both in Gaza and Lebanon. And the government of Israel deserves not just the rhetorical and political support of the United States, but the actual materiel and kinetic support of the United States to rip out the remainder of those sanctuaries. General Professor, any implications from Israel's perspective to those leaks? Well, first of all, I want to refer to what, what was actually leaked. Uh, the uh, wasn't an effort by the NGIA, NGIA uh, to uh, collect information, uh, visual information about the preparations of Israel to uh, uh, reprisal to the uh, Iranian attack on, uh, on Israel on October 1st. They noticed all kinds of preparations and training and drills that uh, the Israelis have uh, conducted, Israeli Air Force have conducted in order to uh, prepare itself to, the, to such a reprisal. This was not information given by Israel to the United States. It's information collected by the Americans on Israel. This by itself is irritating because you say to yourself, why do the Americans spend money and the effort on collecting information on, the, on Israel? But you can understand that they want to know better even though we told them, the president has said that we have informed him what we are planning to, to do. So why do you need to collect information about us? It's one story. This, the other story is that this information, this sensitive information was uh, leaked. Not only leaked, but leaked to an Iranian uh, affiliated uh, website. Uh, this tells you that there are people in the administration uh, that know how to uh, reach uh, the Middle East Spectator. This is the website that was uh, receiving this information. And uh, this this really worries me. It's, uh, if we have in the American administration somebody who is uh, able to do something like that, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's awful. This is awful. And uh, I, I don't blame the administration as such. I'm sure that the, it's not done by the administration, but intentionally by the administration. It's done by somebody from within the administration. And that uh, that is very worrisome, and uh, I think definitely we should be more worried, and more uh, cautious with sharing uh, sensitive information with the Americans because who knows where it goes. It's, uh, this is the first and most important lesson learned from what's happening here, and uh, there must be some closer group of people inside the United States who knows what we're going to do. Because uh, this is not the first time. And the previous cases, there were cases where the administration itself leaked all kinds of information that uh, was given to it. This is, a, this is a very problematic situation right now. Indeed. Well, uh, just to keep in mind that uh, the, the former uh, U.S. envoy for Iran, namely Rob Malley, is still under investigation for uh, his uh, negligent treatment of... Uh, uh, classified material with Iranian elements, uh, as was put, and therefore, uh, while I'm not attributing this leak to him, it just indicates that uh, there are more those kind of people who are easy with uh, um, sharing information, whether or not there are fiscal or monetary uh, uh, consequences for that, or uh, the, it's more of an ideological support. Well, uh, nonetheless, the United States needs to clean shop when we're talking about uh, dealing with classified information. Uh, General Sofrin, we don't have very much time left, and uh, I'd still like to hear uh, your perspective, since uh, n naturally Israel is preparing the classified information that was leaked, indicates that to what degree are the Iranian preparing for countermeasures and also to absorb whatever Israel is planning for it? First of all, let me say that uh, the Iranians are under uh, great pressure. The fact that their uh, foreign minister is running all over the Middle East and trying to uh, find some uh, equation that will ease this uh, Israeli prepared attack on, on, on Iran means that they are under full pressure. They understand that uh, their proxies, the main proxies, namely Hamas and uh, Hezbollah, has been very bad hit. And uh, they won't be able to uh, support them if needed. And uh, now they say that, uh, first of all, we attacked only military sites in Israel and not uh, civilian ones. And we expect, without saying that, of course, openly, that you'll do the same meaning that you'll eat maybe some military targets or military sites and not 
civilian sites and definitely not, definitely not the nuclear sites. And they uh, try to threat that uh, if we are going to uh, take uh, Iran, they are going to escalate, they are going to pay back. But you know, these are rails and uh, we remember what happens on April after we launched our counterattack, which was very precise and very well limited and very well uh, specified on a certain issue. They said that, uh, okay, this, this time it's over, we won't react. And this can be the same scenario right now, if we are going to be very focused and attack what we call some very important military sites, but without causing collateral damage and without touching the nuclear sites of them, I believe that uh, they will think twice before hitting back. But uh, nobody can predict exactly what they're going to do. Now we have to wait and see, of course. Dr. Duran, final sentence. I hope uh, I hope that the administration uh, begins to see this as a war between Israel and Iran, between the United States and Iran, and to call for the surrender of Hamas and the surrender of Hezbollah, uh, and uh, uh, instead of um, continuing to talk about Israel as if it is the aggressor here. As Mr. Billingsley said, for that we need new leadership and hopefully the next leadership in January will bring about the necessary change that would also reevaluate its uh, priorities, uh, not only in the Middle East, but also world at, uh, the world at large. Uh, for that, we are out of time. So I'd like to thank immediately General Sofrin, General Kupelwasser, Mr. Billingsley and Dr. Duran. And I'd like to thank all of you at home as well. Until our next edition from here in Jerusalem, wishing you a good day. Shalom, I'm Danny Ayalon, former Israeli ambassador to the United States, former deputy foreign minister and member of Knesset. Today, I'm very privileged to be hosting TV7's Middle East Review and also being a panelist of the various shows of TV7, which I find the most uh, enlightening, most educating. If you really want to understand the world, the global scene, as well as the regional scene of the Middle East, it is worthwhile to watch TV7.